Hello, and welcome to this recording for the National Charter Schools Founders Library. This year is the 25th anniversary of North Carolina chartering, and one of the people responsible for that is with us today for an interview, and we are delighted to have him for his oral history. This is former speaker Harold Brubaker of North Carolina. Uh, my name is Amber Reichgott Young, and I am the lead for the National Charter Schools Founders Library and was the original author of the Minnesota Chartering Law. So I am looking forward to having a conversation with a legislative colleague colleague who was there in the trenches with me way back in 1996. So Harold, welcome to the National Charter Schools Founders Library. Thank you, Senator. Glad to be a part of it and uh, to share the platform with uh, one of the gurus. Well, that Mr. Speaker, uh, you were speaker during this time that chartering occurred in North Carolina. <clears throat> so uh, we'll start there in just a moment, but I'd love to hear just a little bit more about your background. How did you get into politics in North Carolina? And tell me a little bit of your history. Oh, that's an interesting uh, uh, essay in itself. So I grew up in Pennsylvania uh, on a farm. Matter of fact, the photograph, the painting behind me is the, uh, is the home farm that I grew up on in Pennsylvania, a small dairy farm, chickens, poultry, and a few pigs. Went to a uh, public school system, did my undergraduate degree at a little place called Happy Valley, Penn State University in Ag Econ. And then I wanted to teach in the community college system and the uh, Dean of Penn State said, try North Carolina. They have more community colleges than any other state in the country and you don't have to have a master's to begin teaching. So I said, great. So I called a friend in North Carolina who I had known over the years with my involvement in an organization known as the FFA. And uh, he said he had two openings. And I said, I know where neither one's located, which one's closer to the university where I can work on a master's. So I taught at the uh, community college system for about three to four years and completed a master's in econ at NC State University. While I was teaching, and you know how you can stand in front of a class senator and pontificate your viewpoints. And finally, one old big boy in the back of the room raised his hand and said, well, if you know so much, why aren't you in office? That kind of hits you right between the eyes. And so that kind of led to being getting involved in the local party and uh, a local political scene. And one thing led to the next. And back in the old days, in the 70s, you had to be asked to run for office. I don't know if you encountered that, Senator, or not. You can't just wake up one morning and say, hey, I'm going to run for the legislature. I'm going to run for county commissioner. It didn't work that way. Back in the 70s, you had to be asked by the party. And if you accepted, the party basically shepherded a whole campaign. I think the first campaign I ever ran cost $500. So became a member of the legislature in uh, 1976, one of six Republicans that year. Figured I'd stay about 10 years. Well, 35 and a half years later, after being speaker and senior budget chair, I decided to retire in 2012. That is quite a history. Thank you for your service, first of all. And uh, it is interesting because not many Republicans were in the legislature at that time when you were elected, right? So yes. there's been a change in the political climate over the years. And every, and every 30, 40, 50 years, Senators, you know, you, you go from one side to the next and back to the other side or else they get real, real tight and close in the center. Well, let's go to 1996. Now, uh, you'll recall that in 91, Minnesota passed the first charter school law. That was where I was involved as a senator. Um, but a few years later, a few states came along. North Carolina was one of them. But chartering had been around for about five years. So how did you first hear about it? How did you first, what did you first know about chartering? And how did you find out about it? Actually, uh, believe it or not, I did know of your early uh, forte, Senator, into the charter school arena. And uh, I always thought this is a very unique approach because not only have we, those of us serving in the public bodies, uh, have heard from our school districts year after year that we, all we need is more money. Well, what about the quality of the student? And I believe in the public school system. <clears throat> and so this was a very novel issue to still have a public school called a charter school that was a little different and had more leeway in how they could govern. And so that was a very interesting concept in, in my approach 
So, uh, I used to kind of like to dig back into the archives and find out what worked and what didn't work. And also, I love people that, that think outside the box. And of course, you did that with the original charter school movement back in the early 90s. So that's kind of the background of, of how I kind of got honed into onto the issue of charter schools. And then we had members in uh, the 90, after the 94 election, 95 and 96 and 97, that were all gung-ho for charter schools. And uh, that's kind of the genesis that started the movement in North Carolina. Now, you then were elected the Speaker of the House at that time, so you probably weren't interested in sponsoring many bills when you're in that leadership position, so other people sponsored the bill, uh, but you were involved. But just go ahead and tell me a little bit about the history, about how this happened, because you had a Democratic, uh, let's see, Senate and a yes. Democratic Governor, Republican Correct. House, and uh, it was very much a mixed, uh, a mixed legislature. So how did you get it through all of that? Well, first, you know, after 94 elections and having the, uh, the first Republican majority in 100 years, as a matter of fact, it was 1895, the last time there was a Republican speaker in North Carolina until 1995. Now, wow. since then, we've had, we've had uh, uh, two more and three more that served in, in that capacity. So one of the initial ideas, we had what we called Contract for North Carolina in 94 campaign. And one of them was talking about vouchers and charter schools. And uh, all of a sudden in the debate opened up and we started uh, doing legislation in the house and a number of other issues going through our, uh, you might say our, our plan for North Carolina. And then all of a sudden the governor and the Senate started looking at what are these guys and gals doing in the house. And uh, we had a voucher bill introduced and a charter school bill introduced. And at that time, a friend of mine walked in one day and had a book written by Governor Wild of Massachusetts. And she said, you need to read this chapter. And in that chapter, talked how Governor Wild in uh, Massachusetts had a voucher bill and a, and a uh, charter bill. And as folks got very upset with the voucher approach, they kind of jumped on the charter approach. And I thought that was a very novel idea. So we kind of turned up the flames in North Carolina that we got to go with vouchers. And all of a sudden, all the naysayers, both the House and Senate and governor, jumped on this idea of charter schools. So that was very helpful in getting the background. And that's why the bill legislation moved very quickly uh, through the House at that time. But that's kind of our background here in North Carolina. So you actually created pressure by proposing vouchers in North Carolina. Is that what you're saying? Exactly correct. Exactly correct. And that uh, and that led to the to everybody jumping on board, saying, "Oh no, 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 we can't have vouchers." But you know, we this charter school is a novel idea, and we need to support that. And as a matter of fact, later on, uh, President Clinton visited North Carolina in a joint session of the House and Senate talking about charter schools after we passed the legislation. Well, and President Clinton had always been about the third way. He was, he looked at this as a pragmatic way of having public school choice built into the system without vouchers. What's interesting about what you just said, uh, Mr. Speaker, is that we had the same exact thing happen in Minnesota back five years earlier. Um, we were making the argument that this was better than vouchers. And for uh, the unions and for the Democrats, because it was a Democratic majority, that was something important to them. They thought they could prevent vouchers from occurring. Um, and so uh, it's interesting that same issue, uh, both exactly. federally, Minnesota and North Carolina, mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. the pathway to getting chartering down the middle. And on top of that, Senator, we also said that an existing public school, I don't know if you did this in your state or not, but an existing public school system could switch to charter. We didn't have that. We did not have conversions. None did have you done have that. Did many actually do that? None, because the typical system, they're afraid to think outside the box. And we have some small school systems in the state that, ought to really consider it. 
And that was something we hadn't thought of, but later on in other states, they wanted to have conversions, but very few actually did that. And I think because they liked what they had, uh, um, but, and it was also part of the union situation. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so let me ask you that, uh, how important was the union uh, position on this and were they opposing it while, while it was going through the legislature? Well, Yes, of course, let me back up. While we have the teachers, the NCEA, they, uh, we, the, uh, the Republicans call them a union, but they're really not in North Carolina because we're a right to work state. So you really, you really can't have public unions, but anyhow, they get dubbed with, with the same uh, nomenclature that they're a union. But anyhow, uh, by leading them to down the path that vouchers are gonna be the way we need to go, that's what, again, they begin to look and say, oh, well, so we have a choice. Uh, you want the status quo? You want to go to vouchers? Or do you want to go to this new novel approach, charter schools? While at first they did not come out and endorse the concept, they were basically silent. And of course, that gave the nod to be able to move forward among my Democrat colleagues in the Senate. So they didn't, the Democratic colleagues didn't face the same opposition that we did in Minnesota, which was pretty right. strong and mm -hmm. thereby causing some real um, controversy here, Correct. for sure. Correct. Was it a very Correct. controversial bill overall then as it was passing through the legislature? It was, there was obviously an enormous amount of discussion going on and uh, which was good, which was good. Uh, brought out all the major points uh, of the benefits of charter. And, uh, and the thing that the opponents could, could had a very difficult time arguing that, uh, oh, this is not a public school system. Oh, yes, it is public school system. We're going to get funding basically the same way that our, our other K through 12 in the public school system has it. And so it was, a, it was a hard concept for a lot of them, you might say, to get over the top. But eventually they did, uh, mainly because uh, when we decided that we might have to bring the voucher bill to the floor, that basically ended that discussion. That's so interesting, <laughs> that back pressure. Was the vote close? Uh, we had about 60% of the House members supporting it at the time. How about so in the Democratic WD. Senate? Yeah, uh, well, we uh, ended up, the senators, uh, they, they had some very unique individuals and in leadership over there, business folks, and I'm a business guy, and, uh, and talking to them in terms of choice and uh, decisions uh, parents should be able to make you know, in the real world. And they came around uh, in, a, in a very short period of time. But it took, some, it took some discussion. And who were the major opponents? If the union wasn't really that uh, strong, were there other opponents then to it? Well, school boards, that sort of thing? Yes, the school boards uh, worried about their local dollars you know, being taken away. And, uh, you know, that was, that's, you know, all the sad thing about education all boils down to three things, money, money, money. And, uh, and so the question is, how can you best serve the student and the parents in the, in the community there? So, but then they realized, as the old saying goes, the legislative process, hey, the train's on the track. Now, if you don't get out of the way, this thing's going to go. And it might be detrimental to some of the other things that you might want funding for. And so that was the impetus in terms of getting things uh, rolling. And when it came down to it, it was uh, Senator Wib Gulley, who uh, was in the Senate, who was uh, basically handling the negotiations. I, uh, my House member had some other issues that he was working on. And so I kind of got put into the throes of doing all the final negotiations. Everything was worked out, except how many charter schools can you have? Uh, we had no limit in the house in, in the house side our position uh the senate wanted 25. so i was in on the floor of the house conducting the session from the dais and uh, senator got Wib gully would come up come in the door and come up right to the dais i'd motion him on up he said we we can't do 25. And i said well we were stuck on the minimum of 200. oh my gosh he said well we'll do 50. i said nope 200. so he left went out I guess he went back over to the Senate chamber, came back in a few minutes later, said, uh, uh, we'll, we'll go 75. I said, well, I'll go 150. And I said, that's all I can do. He said, oh, we can't do that. He said, we're just going to let it die. I said, okay. 
I'll stick in the budget or put it some other place where you'll see it again. So he goes out about 15 minutes later, comes back in. All right, a hundred is the lead, the max we can go to. I said, you got a deal, we shook hands on it. Now about two years ago, uh, two or three years ago, uh, the, uh, the the state legislature has taken the cap off charter schools. So we had the 200 cap for years and it was just recently taken off. And, uh, and, and I know we're over the 200 limit right now. Legislative sausage making at its best. That is a great example. <laughs> How much did the governor get involved in this and what was his position? Well, G Governor Hunt was uh, always very much involved in the educational process. And uh, he also saw that the president, President Clinton at that time, was beginning to talk more and more about charter schools. So, and at that point in time, Senator, we did not have veto for the governor. So while he had a large soapbox, it really didn't matter just whatever wow. the House and Senate worked out. And, uh, and you know, I was a culprit. I was the guy that gave the governor veto uh, later on, <laughs> on my way out the door. But, uh, uh, and now, so there is, the, the governor of North Carolina does have veto over, over all legislation, except local bills, constitutional amendments, and redistricting. But, uh, uh, but so Governor, governor Hunt, uh, a very sharp individual, saw this, uh, this movement uh, not only in the state, but nationwide, and saw that the president was jumping on board, so he was with us jumping right on. Matter of fact, did help convince the Senate, this is something we need to do. In your original bill, did you have alternate authorizers? Who were the authorizers for chartering? Uh, it, it, all, it all was the same, it went to the State Board of Education. So you had one authorizer, yeah, the State Board right. of Education. Right, Could the right. local school districts also authorize charter schools? Well, they had to, they had to basically, they, they could oppose it, and they do oppose it. Uh, when we had the uh, uh, charter school starting in Randolph County, basically uh, both school boards uh, wanted to come out and oppose charter schools. You know, Again, afraid of dollars and students taking away from their bottom line. So they're your natural adversaries. So the state board was the authorizer, which I've always maintained is essential to have someone other than the local school district be the authorizer, right? Because in yeah, Minnesota, you'd, you'd never get ahead. it done. Well, right. In Minnesota, <laughs> when our bill passed, it was severely compromised, requiring double approval, the local school district oh. and the state. So as you might imagine, the first seven of nine applications were turned down. And the mm -hmm. only two that got through was uh, one school, City Academy, that, uh, that served students who had already mm -hmm. dropped out of school and mm -hmm. uh, a special needs school called the Metro Deaf School. So those were the only two that got through. So I'm glad to hear that you had that alternate or that higher uh, board, mm -hmm. if you will, uh, right away. So you we, mentioned- We had kind of, we had a luxury of kind of looking over what you did in your state, what other folks did in their states and kind of say, hey, so what's working the best? And you did that because you looked at Massachusetts mm -hmm. and there had mm -hmm. been California and Colorado and Michigan and some others that are actually strong charter school states. So you had mm -hmm. some good lessons to be uh, watching. Well, you talked about Randolph County, which is the county you represented in the house uh, or in the assembly, I guess you call it. Um, and you also told me that it took many years to get a charter school there. So talk about that process years later. Well, it was kind of embarrassing. So having been the Speaker of the House and uh, having this legislation become law and in the late 90s, that it almost took to about 2011, 2012, before we even had an application from uh, Randolph County, my home county that I represented for 35 and a half years in the General Assembly, to even have members come forward and want to chart, want to start their charter school. Now, at that particular point in time, the, the politics behind it was very unique. <clears throat> so we had the State Board of Education chairman was appointed by then Governor uh, Beverly Perdue of, uh, of North Carolina. And, uh, and of course, so we had a, at that point in time, a Republican House, a Republican Senate, and a Democrat governor. And the Board of Education, the majority are appointed by the governor, so therefore basically con controlled by uh, the, the governor's party, the Democrat party at that point in time. 
So our application, the application for the charter schools in Randolph County uh, got a slow start, got uh, thumbs down a time or two. And uh, a good friend of mine who uh, was one of the original starters, uh, uh, Mac Watley, uh, who uh, was a very close friend of mine, and it was the chairman of the Democrat Party for years in Randolph County. But his father had taught in the community college with me back in the early 70s. Mac, when he got out of school in UNC, went to Harvard Law School and then came back to Asheville. But he was very instrumental in working with the charter school. We also had a young lady that was very involved in the political arena in Randolph County in the Democrat Party. This is a county that's in a, in a normal year, a Republican will win 75 to 80 percent of the vote. Mm. And uh, but she had run as a Democrat for the local school board. So after seeing them get turned down a time or two, and I was uh, either fortunately or unfortunately the senior budget writer in the House. Uh, so my other colleagues from Randolph County, Senator Tillman, who was in the Senate at the time and represented Pat Hurley, who was in the House, still in the House right, as of now. And uh, I had him come to my office and we called the chairman of the state school board over to meet with us. And so I gave him the background and said, listen, let's cut through all the fat. I know this is the Republican County. I know your school board is, 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 is uh, dominated by, uh, by the Democrat Party. I understand that. And if I was going to be political, I should be on your side. It looked at me kind of weird. Why? I said, Mac Wally's the former Democrat Party chairman of Randolph County. One of the other ladies that started starting the, the school up was a Democrat candidate for the school board. These are all Democrats, and we should all be against it. But you know what? We got a problem. They're all good people, and they deserve this. They're smart. They know what they're doing. They know what the community wants. And that's why you see uh, the three of us Republicans here that represent Randolph County, House to Senate. Yes, we're supporting the Democrats to get this thing done. It looked to be kind of odd. Something happened next, within a few uh, short period of time, you, you are a uh, charter school got approved for Randolph County. So very bipartisan. And it sounds like there's a bipartisan trend throughout all this. Is that fair to say that chartering yes. has been really bipartisan in North Carolina? Talk about that. It is because education should not be political. Education should not be dominated by Democrats, by Republicans, by independents or anybody. It should be what is best for the students of North Carolina. And, you know, when you look back at our educational system for, what, 100, 200 years or however long, uh, probably closer to 100, uh, you look back and you say, so what was what what was done correctly in, uh, in K through 12 public school and what could we improve on? And frankly, until until the early 90s, Senator, when you came along, nobody thought outside the box. And so uh, everybody said, oh, well, yeah, this is a novel idea. And uh, and so that's how it, that's how it became a bipartisan issue. Uh, it wasn't a Republican or Democrat issue. It was one of people generally concerned about the, the future of education and, and challenges and thinking outside the box. That was, that was the genesis. Why do you think it is so um, partisan today in some states? Uh, chartering seems to have taken on its own uh, pathway in some states. Some think it's a uh, Republican uh, initiative. Some think it's, it comes from the Democratic Urban Coalition. When you talk about that, what is causing that divisiveness right now uh, in some states around chartering? I think in, in, uh, in some of the states, and I can look at North Carolina in particular, the uh, NCEA is probably coming out stronger and stronger against charter schools because they look look at that as a method of siphoning students off of uh, off of the other public schools out there. And, uh, and I, so I see that's more of the trend of where it's happening. The other thing is, uh, over the years, the makeup of, of the, at least the North Carolina legislature, uh, like when, when I first became a member, it was lopsided, you know, uh, 114 Democrats and six Republicans, you know, uh, didn't even matter if we showed up to work or not. Uh, but today, as, as, as races become more competitive, and, uh, <clears throat> and when you have bodies that are, 
out of 120, you might have uh, 60, 66 and 56, you know, it, it's a lot closer than it used to be. Uh, I had one term speaker when I had a majority by one vote. Uh, the Senate pro tem, a Democrat, had the majority in the Senate by one vote when I was speaker. So when, when you have when you have this area, you might say, of, uh, of uh, margins closer, then issues become more political. That's what I've seen happening over the over the period of time. Not specifically directed in that direction, but it just becomes a very tight issue because in in some states in North Carolina, the, the predominant members of the Democrat minority in the House and Senate are from the real large cities, which they probably should have more charter schools than anybody else, and some of them do. Uh, whereas the the the, uh, the predominance of the uh, uh, party in control now in North Carolina, the Republican Party and House and Senate is 90% uh, rural. So you have different needs in different areas. And, and I think that all plays into the to the changes we're seeing in society. But uh, it's a great idea. And we should never forget that, uh, that uh, the importance of charter schools as part of the public school system uh, throughout the country. And that's one of the reasons why we founded this library was to capture the origins, hear the history from leaders like you, the pioneers like you, um, talk about the bipartisan origins and talk about the why and the how for chartering so that we can preserve that for the future. If there is need to refresh our memories given the divisiveness and the you know partisan myths that are going around. So to your, from your perspective, um, what have been some of the greatest lessons we've learned in chartering uh, that we might want to share with uh, educators and policymakers? What, what are some of the, the, the lessons we've learned, both good and bad? I, I think uh, the number one lesson that we learned that just because you have a group of people <clears throat> that want to get together and start a charter school, uh, you need to make sure you've got the, the right mix of individuals, number one. Number two, are you going to be financial viable? And can you, can you, can the, uh, the folks wanting to do the school, do they have some experience in running something similar, i.e. a business? Because it basically it could be correlated with, with the, the idea of a business uh, running an operation. And that's where we've had some fail because probably the due diligence was not as done as in depth. Uh, that can you run the system? Can you run the school system? And uh, how are your finances? And do you have plans for alternatives? Because by the time Randolph, in Randolph or you already charter school came along, you, all, you had to have access, as I recall back, uh, this is uh, digging back 25, 30 years ago, that you had to have a backup, you had to have a bank or someone to be able to back you for five hundred thousand to a million dollars that first year to get started, well, you had to have a pretty solid plan. Number one, number two, to go somebody go to a bank that's going to do that, you had to have solid individuals and a solid background. So the ones that that I saw fail over the years were those that did not have that ingredient, the the fiscal part. Uh, how are you going to sustain yourself financially? How are you going to grow? And uh, do you know what your minimum student body requirement is to break even? And, uh, and I saw, I look back and, and think that is the main cause for failure, finances. And the people <clears throat> who oversee the finances are of course board members and authorizer, right? So maybe right. those are areas that we need to be looking at for stronger schools. Exactly, exactly. Make sure the members on the board is not just like, who wants to be on the charter board? Raise your hand, you know. Uh, no, it's uh, uh, an application process. I know, for example, you are, they now have gone through an application process if you want to, if you would like to join the board. Uh, and uh, since it's, uh, it's quasi-public, but yet it's not, those members are not elected by the general public, but uh, uh, they do go through a qualifications. For example, on our on the first board here in Randolph that you already when it started, we had a, had a, for example a, an attorney, uh, a banker, and I think a mem maybe it was more than one banker on the board, uh, two or three at one time. But people with backgrounds like that, CPAs, business people that knew fiscal soundness, and I think that's what kind of kicked off Uari. And why Uari has grown, uh, when they started out, it was like 
three grades, three upper grades, and now they're K through 12, which is what I what I had hoped to see. It was my dream to, to see that. And fortunately, we had great folks in Randolph that took that dream and ran with it. And one of them was Rhonda Dillingham, I understand, exactly. who is now the mm -hmm. uh, executive director of the NC um, Charter School Association. Um, that is correct. She was one of the one of the two original culprits to get this started in Randolph County. And talk about that school. You you mentioned the name Uari. It sounds like a Native American name. Talk about the school and and its origins. How did it come? Up? Who 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 wanted it? Who were the parents and the families involved? So the uh, uh, Rhonda was part of the original team that started it, and her and her colleague were uh, at what we called a zoo school. It was part of the Ashburn City Public School System, but had uh, modular units stuck at the uh, at our zoological park in Randolph County, which oh. by the way, uh, Randolph County, North Carolina Zoological Park is located in Randolph County, North Carolina, Ashburn in particular. It has over 2000 acres of land. It is the largest, uh, you, the largest uh, land centered zoological park anywhere in North America. And it's, it's the largest around. And so it was a great center. And, uh, and so uh, th this is where the original genesis started with the uh, two ladies that kind of headed up the, the zoo school. And uh, of course, when the word got out, then they were starting to receive all, all types of negative uh, comments from the higher ups at the Board of Education, the city, city school system and all that. But they, they toughed it through. Uh, they, they kept going with the idea and their, and their uh, perseverance paid off. Well, congratulations, because as you say, it's doing quite well today from what I understand. Um, it is, I it is. That. And, it, and the term you already said, and I forgot to put, throw that in there. You already, we have a, we have a chain of mountains that goes through uh, uh, Randolph County. That's kind of a, a native, uh, a native uh, American native name. So you are, the you mountains goes through Randolph County. So why not have the you charter schools? And one of the things you did have was, was strong board members, which we talked about. And I feel very strongly about the need for good governance for chartering. That's one of the keys for success. The other, of course, are good leaders like Rhonda. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, but the other thing is a good authorizer. So talk about mm -hmm. your state board as an authorizer. How does it do its work? Has it been effective? Do you need alternate authorizers in North Carolina? Well, no, it's it's uh, basically it's based on per pupil. Uh, the the interesting part is that we, that the, that the charter school movement has always had a tough time, while the public while the general public school system that's non charter they will get a per student allocate allocation for capital. The charter schools do not in North Carolina, so they they're almost starting out with one hand tied behind their back that they got to go into some very unique planning in terms of how they build their school. Uh, and most of them end up doing it privately funded. There are companies out there that will come in and uh, buy the land. If you want to purchase the land, build the buildings and lease it back to you over so many years for them to recap the investment, then it would turn it over to you after so many years. Uh, so, so, so when they started out, that was that was kind of a, a unique position. And as a matter of fact, it's one of the things the charter movement in North Carolina still continues to work on, mm -hmm. uh, of being able to get dollars for capital. It seems every time they get about they get one or two steps in the direction that it could happen, then somebody comes in and nixes it, whether it's a, a veto uh, uh, from a governor or whether it's one body, House or Senate decides they can't go that route. But uh, but that's that's the the main stumbling block that's been through the years with charter schools in North Carolina. To how do you get a piece of the action or a piece of the dollars for capital? That's a big issue too. Um, I know in Minnesota we came back a number of years later and we developed lease aid, which was a substitute mm -hmm. for that, mm -hmm. so that they could at least rent and have money mm -hmm. for that. And so they got about 90% of the amounts that overall that uh, district public school would have. But, um, but I can't believe you still don't have facilities aid in North Carolina. That's mm -hmm. got to be very tough for those and, schools. 
and think about it this way. Look how it blows your mind. So here, here you have a system that's starting at uh, lacking capital, but to get the per pupil allocation that the, their other sisters and brothers in the public school system get, and yet they're, they're able to do everything without any more money. Somebody is sleeping at the switch. <laughs> well, imagine what they could do uh, oh. if uh, they had the full amount, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about that. One of the things I'm interested in as a Democrat uh, is um, how we can bring the charter sector and the district sector together, how we can learn from one another, what kind of innovations we can share. As you just said, sometimes charters can do more with less. How can we share that information and what can we learn from districts? Is any of that going on in North Carolina? Are they working together at all to try to share information? Uh, sadly, no. It's more, this is my turf and that's your turf. Stay off of mine. I'm not going to get in yours. Uh, ideally, that's what should happen uh, for for the for the two systems to work together. Because I think there's always good ideas. Uh, as I used to say when I was in the campaign mode and in, in office, neither the Democrats nor the Republicans have all the good guys. They're good people on both sides of the aisle, and you got to learn to cross the aisle and work together. And and what's what's ironic? So you you have systems, school systems, where the uh, the the, the segment of the public school system that is not charter uh, might have a board all Democrats and the charter might have all board Democrats and you think they could get along, but they don't because it's your turf versus my turf. That's a million dollar question, Senator, and I haven't figured out how you overcome that. Uh, when you find out, let me know. <laughs> I haven't found the answer either, <laughs> but uh, some states have done it. Um, and I, I think, again, it's all about the kids, isn't it? It's about putting the focus on the child because that's mm -hmm. where it should be. Exactly so, right. Given all of your <clears throat> years of experience uh, as a legislator, as a charter pioneer, what is your advice to the policymakers of today in North Carolina and around the country about chartering? What should they be thinking about? How can we make it better? What can we do to sustain it for the next 25 years? First, always think outside the box. Think about how you can do something better than what you have today. There's always room for improvement, no matter what we have or what we're doing. And so I, that's what I would encourage the leaders to do today of both parties. Think outside the box. How do we prove, how do we improve K through 12? We have, so we have the charter and the, and the other side of the public school system. Yes, we've had failures in both sides uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the equation on both sides of the public school system. So when we have a public school system that fails, we either have, uh, have the state superintendent come in and take over that system and bring in new people to, to address their, their deficiencies because you'd learn you learn to learn from their problems and learn from successes of other districts. So if we do that within our systems, why don't we work ac across, across uh, you might say across the table uh, for both sides of the public, of the public school system to get along, share what they, what they know is a success and share what is not successful. And that's how we, better, we build a better school system. It's all about the kids, the bottom line. So you and I probably are both closer to the middle of our parties, I think. And so that's easy for us to say, but of course we have a lot of partisan extremes now. So perhaps we have to wait for it to come back because you probably know that up till 2016, two thirds of America supported chartering. And I mean, what else does two thirds of America exactly. support, right? Now exactly. that has gone down because in the last few years, <laughs> They've got sort of chartering got conflated with vouchers in the <laughs> Trump administration. And uh, so the support is going down. Um, but how do we bring that back again so that the public truly understands chartering? I, how do we make that message come through loud and clear? I think one of the things we should do more in a charter school movement <clears throat> is uh, touting our successes. Uh, whether it's an inner school, an inner city school where you've had uh, the kids in, the, in their corollary system fail and how they came into a charter school and how one-on-one -on -one, uh, 
lot of cases has has built that young child up into a great human being. And uh, so we've got to tout our successes. Uh, in the early phases, you've heard more successes, but then the naysayers always would throw up those that fail. And in starting out, when they, anytime you have a new experiment, just like we have with had with charter schools, uh, you you have a growing growing pains. And we had growing pains in North Carolina where we would have some start and fails. Oh, look at that! These these guys and gals don't know what they're doing, but. As, as we matured in the charter school system in North Carolina, we got a lot more tons of successes versus the small minute amount of failures. And we need to learn to build up more and promote more of the successes of the charter schools. It's, 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 it's something that, that should be in, on every, uh, every newspaper and every TV uh, uh, station throughout, throughout North Carolina. And uh, even the public public TV sector should be uh, we should be supporting, uh, promoting more, and telling the story because it's the best kept secret. Very frankly, the history as well as the success of the charter school system. So I think that's what we have to do. I totally totally <clears throat> agree with that. Um, I was um, thinking about over the uh, time. Uh, some of the schools you said closed and they didn't do well and they probably needed to close because they weren't academically successful or financially successful. Mm -hmm. Well, that was one of the fundamentals that we built into the chartering law, which would say that if you don't succeed and you have time to improve that you would be mm -hmm. closed so that we could protect those kids. Um, mm -hmm. Talk about the accountability um, aspect of this. What I've seen over time is that actually some of the districts are picking up on the same thing. They are now using data more to assess whether the district schools are succeeding and in some cases closing district schools, but not many. So talk about the accountability side of this and what chartering has done to promote that. So over the uh, period of, of now 25 years in North Carolina and having a great track record for charter schools, the, the successes of uh, being accountable uh, more of an open book, if you will, uh, for the charter schools, looking at their finances. And, and again, like you said, Senator, this the dynamics of the charter school movement was building in, if you will, uh, a measuring, measuring tool uh, successfully in terms of curriculum and also successful in terms of financing. And golly, Ned, if we'd have that all the way across the board, well, what a what a new day it would make in in uh, throughout all all public schools. And so, as a result of that, as a result of looking at the successes that develop, I think we're able to we have we do have the other side of the public school system, the non charter, that are some of them are are very much in tune, more the of the uh, I'd say superintendents that that. Don't look at, a, at an issue and say, oh, the answer is no, but look at it and say, well, how can we benefit from this? What can we take that is very beneficial uh, that they're doing in the, in the charter, in the charter movement and use it over the non-charter movement? <clears throat> so I think you do see some of that, but the beauty of the whole movement was that there was a level a standard put in there for success financially and accept success for the students, which Golly, Ned, we don't have that in the other side of the equation with the non charter schools. Well, that is well <clears throat> said. Mr. Speaker, you've had such an experience with chartering and so appreciated. I'm wondering if you have any documents hidden away that might be helpful to add to our library. Is that uh, somewhere hidden in a, in a, archived library somewhere in North Carolina that you might want to contribute to our library? I'll, uh, I'll have to check back through and see what we have and be glad to. Because that's the other piece about our library is that we love having the oral histories. And then if you have any documents that you have to share that, or maybe a little history or timeline that mm -hmm. might be helpful that you want to provide, we love having that. And, um, and I, I want to just kind of close our interview now uh, with just a, a little bit about the library and maybe why it's important. Um, we're only a couple of years old now and uh, we are, gathering these histories uh, one by one in the states. Do you see a need, do you see 
uh, a benefit? Do you see ways we can use these resources to improve chartering in the future? What would you what would you use this library for if you could? Oh, absolutely. Uh, by having a documented record, and I think I think to be very transparent with the movement, uh, the fact that we 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 bring out front our failures and also our major successes that we have, and so that's where the library would be extremely difficult. And and somebody new in a new part of the of the country that might be thinking of doing a charter school. Well, the beauty of going to the library is to say, here's what failed. We got to stay away from that. Here's where the top successes are. That's what we want to build on. That's the value of the library. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for this interview. I do want to acknowledge, first of all, that uh, the National Charter Schools Founders Library is a subunit of the National Charter Schools Institute in Michigan, headed up by uh, Jim Gunner, Dr. Jim Gunner, who is the visionary behind this. It's been a pleasure to build it. And I also want to thank Rhonda Dillingham and her association for sponsoring this video to make it to make it possible for future pioneers to be able to access. Um, so we really appreciate your time. I'll just end by asking if you have anything else you wanna add about your work in chartering or the what you see for the future of chartering in North Carolina. I, I guess my ending statement would be, uh, Senator, folks like yourself and the library keep the momentum going. Uh, you've always got to be in the forefront. You've all, always got to be pushing forward the ideas. Never, never give up on the issues because we know the success it can be. And with that, I think it's a great place to end. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have so enjoyed having you. I understand now you have your own firm that you're working with lobbying and other clients. Is that right? That What's it called correct. again? Yes. It's Brubaker called Associates. Brubaker, Brubaker and Associates. Associates. All right. So people can contact you there if they need to. Thank you Thank so you. much. We appreciate your time and all of your pioneering work in chartering. You are indeed a pioneer. Thank you. Thank you, Senator.